Hello everyone, welcome to Cartoon Network Studios Career Spotlight Series where we're going to dive deeper into the various jobs that make up a TV animation studio. This is the Writing for TV Animation panel. Really excited for this. Uh, this panel, we are talking to two of our writers to learn more about writing for script and board driven TV animated shows at Cartoon Network Studios. So my name is Jesse Juano. I'm part of the development team here at Cartoon Network, and I'll be moderating this panel along with my team. If you have any questions for our panelists, uh, please click on the Q&A button below and write them in. We will try to answer them in the later half of this webinar. So uh, Jeff and Kate, we're so excited to have you guys. Uh, please start off and introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Okay. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm currently a staff writer on Adventure Time Distant Lands, and before that I was a writer on Steven Universe Future. Um, a little bit about how I got here is I grew up in Hong Kong and California. I always liked making art, but I didn't think I could make a living doing it. So I did the practical thing and I went to college to study to be a medical examiner um, because I love Dana Scully from the X-Files. <laughs> um, but while I was there, I took a film class and that's when I realized that, no, this is what I wanna do. I wanna make art and I wanna tell stories. Um, so I guess the lesson there was I didn't really wanna be Dana Scully. I wanted to make the X-Files. So I went to NYU, um, to the graduate film program, made live action and animated shorts there. And when I got out, I applied to the Frederator Go Cartoons Incubator program and made an animated short with them there. And for a little bit, I was kind of floundering. I, I didn't really, my career got stalled. I really wanted to make a live action feature, but I didn't know how to do that. I didn't have the resources. So I worked other jobs um, where I was a makeup artist, I was um, a costume designer for a little bit, and I was also a PA. Uh, but a couple of years ago, a classmate of mine at NYU introduced me to an exec at Cartoon Network, and nothing came of that meeting <laughs> initially, but um, we did keep in touch, and she added my name to the list of um, writers at the Cartoon Network um, database of talent. And later on, when Steven Universe Future was looking for new writers, my name was on that list. And I had an interview with a showrunner, and that led to my first TV animation writing job. And Distant Lands is my second. And more recently, I wrote and directed my first live action feature film. Yeah. Wow, yeah. That was, that's tough to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Jeff Trammell. I'm the story editor, which is a fancy word for head writer of uh, Craig of the Creek. Um, my start, uh, I started out in Detroit, Michigan, where I was born. Um, I did not go to college. I didn't really know what I wanted to do once I became an adult. So I went to a trade school for video production. And while I was there, I discovered the show 30 Rock and found out that, uh, you know, that show was about them working in a writing room. And I was like, oh, you can get paid to write comedy. I love jokes and I like writing. Uh, I guess this is what I'm gonna do. So um, I taught myself how to write scripts from reading books and downloading all the scripts I could online. And uh, eventually I wrote my first spec script, which for those who don't know, is a script based on an existing show. It's kind of like an example of a show that like, if you got hired on this show, would you be able to write for these characters? Um, I wrote a spec script for The Office that was very bad, but I had written a thing, so uh, I felt like I could actually do the job if I ever got the chance. Um, after a few years of working a bunch of different other jobs, um, like at the airport, loading and unloading planes, and uh, Target as an asset protection agent, um, I realized that I wanted to become a writer, so I had to figure out how to get out to Los Angeles. <laughs> I found out about the Nickelodeon writing program and I entered that. Uh, they get like 2000 applicants a year minimum and they choose like four people. I was fortunate enough to be one of those four people. I moved out to LA to be in the program back in 2015 
while I was there, I got to write on Harvey Beaks and Glitch Text. And uh, maybe six months after finishing the program, I was lucky enough to come to Cartoon Network to start on Craig of the Creek season one. And I've been there for the last three years. So yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both for being here. So excited. You both have like such different backgrounds. That's like, I think gonna be really inspiring to the people watching this. So thank you again for being here. Um, let's start off. Uh, what does it mean to be a writer in TV animation? Like, what is that? What is that job? Hmm. <laughs> I would say it's, uh, it's, it's really creative and it's incredibly collaborative. Um, you spend your day basically working with a group of people to tell stories. Yeah, I mean, and it definitely depends on show to show too, but for us on Craig, it's like, I would say even more collaborative than most other shows because we're not just working with the other writers in our writer room. Usually we have storyboard artists, we will have meetings with the designers, uh, with props, with background designers, everyone to kind of like see what stories they also want to get a chance to tell via our show. So. It's a very collaborative process, um, which is interesting because I think when you start out writing, it does seem like it's just you a lot of the time, kind of like bouncing your own ideas off the wall. But um, there's a lot of different people that are involved in the process, which is really fun and really helps you get different point of views. You mentioned artists. Do you have to be an artist to do this job as a writer? If that was a requirement, I would not be here. <laughs> I, I cannot draw to save my life. Uh, <laughs> so I think it definitely helps if you are a great artist, um, but you do not have to be, not at all. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And um, it, you don't have to be an artist, but I think it is helpful if you can think in pictures or think visually, um, but not a requirement. Uh, what are the different job titles within the writer's room? Hmm. There's staff writer, which is kind of, uh, I don't, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to describe this. Kate, how would you describe a staff writer? Um, I would say the staff writer is sort of, it's you, you are there helping craft the story, um, and there's a hierarchy, basically. You are sort of at the, not at the bottom, but you are. <laughs> it's an entry, you know, it's a sort of an entry level position. Um, I entered as an apprentice writer um, and then moved on to staff writer. Um, so I was able to sort of learn on the job as an apprentice. And my duties as an apprentice writer and the staff writer are basically the same. Um, and above me, is the story editor, the head writer, and everybody reports to the showrunner. Yeah, so I would say normally as a staff writer, you might find yourself really focusing on maybe one episode at a time, sometimes two, depending on the show, but usually you can divert your focus to that story and trying to figure it out. And that would then go up to the story editor once you turn that in and they're reading and noting uh, and giving feedback on multiple stories at once, sometimes depending on how many staff writers they have or how many freelancers they have and really like overseeing quite a few episodes before those go up to the uh, showrunners. Okay. Um, we've talked a lot about in gen general that not everyone always knows what's the difference between a script driven show and a board driven show and how's that different writing for? A script driven show usually will be a show that is purely scripted, much like how you think of like a movie script or anything like that. So, um, you know, like you as the room will usually decide who's gonna write it. Someone will write that script and then everyone will read it together and give notes. And then that script will go to the board team who usually is to stick to that script and usually won't deviate from it too much. Whereas a board driven show, 
uh, you write a, a outline, which is basically like the skeleton of the story. You want to hit all the emotions and all the beats and make sure that the story tracks. But unlike a script, you won't get too in depth with it. There's still a lot of wiggle room, but you want to, the tough thing is trying to write an outline for a show because if you don't give enough information, the board team could get lost or they might misinterpret something that you're trying to set up. But if you give them too much information, then it's very strict and regimented and they don't have any room to play. But um, on a board driven show, you give them the outline and then the board team will go off and they'll not only draw it, but also write dialogue. So they really have a, a big investment in these characters and a lot of say in how they feel and how they act, which I think allows the board team to really get to stretch their limbs when it comes to that um, episode. And also um, with board driven shows, because the board artists have so much input and um, creative control over the episode, there's more rooms for like sight gags and cool visuals, like cool fights um, or action sequences. Whereas in a scripted show, it might not have that kind of room to play. And on board driven shows, the board artists are actually credited as the writers of the mm -hmm. episode because of how much they contributed to it. And the writers are given a story by credit. Okay. Uh, do you feel like most writers should know to, how to work on both or are more most people kind of specialized? I think if you can write for one, you can write for the other. <laughs> it's like, it's sure. all writing is writing and storytelling. Um, both are structured. Um, at least in the rooms I've found to be, you know, three act structure, that kind of thing is pretty standard. Um, and it's more just in the format that you're telling your story. That's the difference. And that can be learned. Yeah, I agree. I will say that I think one of the pros of writing for a board driven show is that you get to see how your words are going to be reflected through someone else. Uh, so you might assume, oh, well, yeah, they know what I mean if I say this thing, and it might not come across that way. But also you get to learn, I think, a, you get, it's a better experience for learning, oh, this is the work that I'm putting upon someone else. So if I'm writing like, oh, there's a huge crowd scene and I'm writing a script, I might not realize that when that goes to that board team, they have to draw 20 different characters, all because I wrote there's a huge crowd scene. So I think it does make you a bit more aware of what you're putting out there for the team that's going to take over what you're writing. For sure. Crowd scenes. And also, um, <laughs> I think, uh, like, not, neither one is better than the other, but they might lend themselves better to different stories. For example, mm -hmm. like you mentioned earlier, board-driven shows, like, have more room to play and, like, can be more fun when it comes to action. Um, whereas um, it probably might not be as great if you have a very long dialogue scene or if it's a mystery show where you have to keep track of really specific points of information throughout the episode that's better for um, a scripted yeah. format for sure <clears throat> can you guys talk about the differences uh, between writing for 11 minute and 22 minute episodes and generally how many pages is that hmm. um when you're writing for 11 minutes, it feels like there's not enough time. And when you're writing for 22s, <laughs> it feels like there's not enough time, which is weird. <laughs> um, I would say uh, usually an 11 minute story will, for the most part, focus on one story. You might have like a few runners or you might have a B story. Whereas in my um, experience, a 22 will usually have an A story and a B story. So there'll be something else kind of going on in the background that you can cut away to maybe even a C story. Um, I would say in animation, a 11 minute is usually about 14 pages and a 22 might be about 26 pages. Um, I'm curious if you found that to be different, Kate? Um, since my experience is mostly in board driven, um, I'd say that with 11 minutes, um, I agree that it's really, it's really good to keep the story simple because you might be able to have like some tiny B plot, but for the most part, you have, it's gonna get lost or it could make the story really confusing or muddled if you put too much into it. Um, 
but for our outlines um, for an 11 minute show, it's usually three to four pages. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, actually, since, Kate, since you mentioned live action, can you talk a little bit about just in a brief, the differences of uh, writing for animation and writing for live action? Yeah. Um, so I've heard people say <laughs> that like you have to write differently or more visually for animation compared to writing for live action. But I think that's just people wanting to protect their jobs. I think if you can write for <laughs> one, you can write for the other because you should be writing visually for both. Like uh, you should be painting in pictures for both formats. Um, so the thing about animation is that you are working in a medium where characters and objects don't have to move in a realistic way. So you can play to that and write for that. Um, and there's more opportunities for visual jokes and things that aren't possible in live action. Um, and for the board driven shows, um, because we can't rely on dialogue, um, we have to write things in, in a really clear visual way for the borders. And that would be sort of where it's slightly more different, but if you can write for one, you can write for the other. For sure. Um, you know, going back to Jeff, you talk about being head writer, story editor. What is the day-to-day -day like for that job? Um, hmm. It really varies. Um, on Craig, we oversee a lot of different things, which is nice because, um, you know, it's not just overseeing stories for me, but usually as the head writer, um, we'll talk about story ideas. I'll give notes on the stories that our staff writers turned in, as well as whatever freelancers we may have had. Um, it's a lot of like figuring out the big picture stuff uh, because, you know, we're lucky enough to be able to like oversee quite a few things at once. And uh, also, depending on the day, I might be at a voice record, uh, assisting the voice director, or I might be helping with an edit. Um, so it's, there's a lot of different hats you wear, I think, as the story editor, whereas, um, you know, elsewhere, you might just focus on stories. I know there's other shows that have had, like, bigger teams, and if you have, like, for staff writers, you're probably busy overseeing all of those different stories. But for us, our room's a bit smaller, so it does allow me to like focus on stories as well as other areas of the production, which is pretty cool. Can you guys talk a little bit about what like the average day in like, a writer's room is like? Hmm. I would say um, it depends on where you are in the season. Like if you're starting out a new season, um, uh, a lot of that time will be devoted to blue skying, which means you know coming up with ideas of what you'd like to see um, in the forthcoming season. And then when you've sort of hammered out what you'd like the story to be for the whole season and various episodes, then you can start meeting specifically about one episode at a time and your meetings will be more hyper-focused on breaking an episode. Definitely. Um, oh, let's continue. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and sometimes, you know, if you're still on, because um, writers are usually first in and first out on a show, um, you might not getting to see like the entirety of an episode getting made. So sometimes you're only there just to write but if you're lucky enough to be on while an episode is going through to the end you might help with like punching up the recording script that might happen um, or as Jess said be in the recording session to help out if somebody needs a line change right then. Could you guys talk a little bit about the differences between what <clears throat> sorry um a premise, outline, and a draft are, and how much time do you have to write each? Time always depends on the show. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's been times where we've had, oh, we don't need this episode for a month, and there's been times where we need this episode yesterday. Uh, so it definitely changes up. Um, but 
usually for us, a premise is about one to two pages. It's just a bare bones version of the story. Um, this is kind of where we start. This is where we end. These are the emotions we need to track. This is how it'll be fun, just so we can really like explain that story in a very brief way to our executives. Um, and then an outline would be about three to four pages. That's a bit more of what we just had, but now we can infuse jokes. We can find different areas for comedy. We can really like track and lay out like, this is what we need to see. These are the locations. These are the characters that can pop up for a bit, you know, just to kind of like really make the episode fun because this is gonna go to the board artists. So we need to make sure that everything's spelled out. Um, drafts uh, are more of a scripted thing, of course. Um, usually for drafts, you will do three drafts, um, kind of like the first draft, you'll get notes and then take on the second. And then if needed, you'll usually do a third draft. Um, for those I found, depending on the show, you'll usually have like a week or two between those drafts to turn around. Um, so yeah, I would say usually a premise, maybe a few days and outline about a week or so, and then a draft, depending on the show, a week or two. And sometimes you'll be working on different episodes um, at the same time, like they'll yeah. overlap. So you'll be working on a premise for one and then breaking the outline for the next for one. Thank you guys. Um, we get this question uh, a little bit. If you're a storyboard artist, is it possible to transition to staff writer? Definitely. Um, a very talented storyboard artist I know named Chris Mackay uh, became a very talented writer I know named Chris Mackay. Um, <laughs> and uh, I know that she transitioned over. I, I think that as a storyboard artist, especially on a board driven show, you're doing a lot of writing anyway. So I think a lot of the time it's just learning how to format that for what is quote unquote acceptable for a premise or an outline. But um, I do know that for season three, we had a couple board artists uh, on Craig uh, write a story that where they wrote the premise and outline. So I definitely think it's possible. Um, and I encourage anyone who wants to do it to do it because we need more unique voices in those rooms. I'm gonna change into, you know, I guess the writing portfolio questions that we have. Uh, first of all, what is a writing sample and how many of them should you have? I was, I was waiting to see if you were going to talk. And then, of course, you talked and I talked over you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, uh, writing is writing. Um, and in my experience, I've found that the format is less important than you being able to show you can tell a story. Um, like, I've known writers who've gotten into the room through comics and story, like short stories and novels um, and comedy videos. Um, in my case, my portfolio is my short films. But that being said, it's still good to have a script as a supplemental piece of writing to show you can actually write in the format. Like all that other stuff that you love making, that's important to show your voice. Um, but being able to have a, a, like a short script is really helpful as well. Um, and when I applied to Stephen Universe Future, I had like a, I think it was like an eight page script um, of an original pilot. And then when I applied for Adventure Time, I sent in my feature script. Um, so if you don't have a sample script yet, I would say try, like challenge yourself to write something short, maybe something in five to 10 pages. That way, if it's uh, not up to your standards in the end, at least, <laughs> you know, you did it as an exercise. Um, but if it is, now you have a sample piece. And um, also, because reading is really time consuming, um, only send your best work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I did break that rule by sending a feature script. <laughs> which was not <laughs> Don't do that, but that was my only sample and I, I was really proud of it. Um, but if you're like caught between a sample that you really love and think is good versus a sample that's like, fine, but it sort of fits the genre or tone of the show you're applying for, 
definitely send the better samples than the one you love because um, that'll show your voice clearer. Yeah, I could not agree more. I think, you know, much like you, I've seen people have gotten into the room because, oh, they did this really cool comic or they made this really cool, like, short online or, you know, you know, there's a myriad of different ways to get into the room, I say. Um, but I will say that from, in my opinion, make sure that you are prepared for, for anything that someone could ask for as a sample. When I applied to Cartoon Network, they were looking for an 11 minute, 11 minute original sample and I didn't have one. So I had to figure out one that I was passionate about and write it very quickly so I could try to get staffed on the show that I didn't get staffed on, but I still love. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, because of that, uh, I would say always try to have as many samples as you can. Be passionate about them, but try to find one that fits. So if you get asked for an 11 minute original or a 22 minute spec or an outline, you at least have those things. So you're not like scrambling to write them and send them out. Jeff, I know you mentioned earlier about how you wrote a spec script for the Nickelodeon writing program. Do you recommend having a current spec script on hand? And to remind everyone, spec script is a script based on an existing TV show. I think so. I think specs are, you know, it's tough because there are definitely times where people want specs and then there are other times where they're like, send me something original. I think specs are important because one, I think they're easier to write because you're writing these characters that already exist in this world that's established. So you really just get to play with the toys and show your own writing style, which is a lot easier than having to create a world and you know do the same. So I think specs are important for that reason. I also think that um, they can be fun, you know? Like if you're a big fan of a show, why wouldn't you want to write an episode of that show? I think just don't, if you get the opportunity to send that spec to someone, don't send it to someone who works on that show because they legally cannot read it. <laughs> um, but I think uh, specs are important and they're fun and they're nice training for you as a writer to learn how to work with characters. But also like when you get ready to start your own original you'll know a bit more of the tricks of the trade because you've practiced them on this thing that already is, you know, existing. Thank you. Um, so when a writer is writing like a sample original or a spec, uh, should they keep in mind things like seeing prop character counts for a sample or should they go wild with like crowds everywhere? How do you guys, or is it better to look more like you're production ready? I I don't know if this is like I don't know. <laughs> uh oh. What's what common? <laughs> but I would say no. Don't keep in mind all this stuff because it's different from show to show. Each show has their own like amount of characters or props or backgrounds that they can use in each episode. You're not going to know what it is. Um, so write what it is you really want to see. If it's a bunch of crowds, you know, do it if that makes you happy. Um, like, do you and do it to 100% and let people know what it is you want to do. Yep, I agree. Write what makes you happy, write what's fun, write what you would want to see. And, you know, if you get that job, they can tell you to not use a bunch of props. <laughs> but, um, you know, for, for now, it's your sample. So you should come across as how you come across. So just go all out. Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, what are, I guess, sort of jumping off of that, what are you and your supervisors looking for in scripts? Or original stories mm -hmm. and novels, etc. When I'm reading, I'm usually looking for comedy, first and foremost. If you can, if it makes me laugh, I'll have a good time. Um, you know, if it's a comedy script, if it's like a drama, then I'm not looking to laugh all the time. Um, but, you know, like, I'm looking to see, like, one, is this fun? Is this funny? Am I enjoying it? Because that'll keep me invested. Um, two, I want to see, like, does the story track? Am I feeling the emotions that I'm supposed to be feeling for these characters? If, you know, someone's 
looking to make a team, do I care? Do I want to see them make the team? And that's a hard thing to pull off. But, you know, if, if I can feel that connection with those characters, then I know that, like, you as a writer are doing your, your due diligence in, like, making them likable and making me root for them. Um, and also just, like, structure stuff, which I look for to see if you have a basic idea of structure. If you don't, that's fine. Structure can be taught. I didn't know structure when I started the writing program. And now it's arguably one of my stronger qualities if you ask my bosses. <laughs> so I'm not too like married to that, but I do want to see if there's a basic like, oh, well, you know, this is where the story kind of starts to peak. And this is when I want the character to have what they want the most and it gets taken away. You know, I want to see if those emotions really track. And I'm not in a position to hire, but I might be in the future. And <laughs> what I would look for, um, is somebody with a really clear point of view and a voice. Um, and if they can just tell a good story in general. There, there are many types of writers. There's comedy writers, there's people who like have a bunch of unexpected ideas. Um, know your strengths and play to that. Like I, I know my own strengths are also structure and I'll, I love writing offbeat stories with heart. So now that I know that all my samples um, are that like to a hundred percent. So just, yeah, figure out what it is you like to do and really clearly communicate that with your script. So one of our biggest questions and you guys have probably been asked this plenty of times, but do you need an agent? And if you don't have an agent, how do you get your stuff read? I don't have an agent, so I'll let Jeff take this one. I don't have an agent. I do have a manager, which is like an agent, but different in some way that I don't fully know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think, I definitely think that it helps to have a manager, but I don't think that they're, or an agent, I don't think it's mandatory. I know for a lot of times the Catch-22 is you usually have to be working for them to kind of show interest in you. Um, I would say a way to try to get your work seen is, you know, there's tons of writing programs. I'm a product of one. There's also, you know, they're all over the place. You look into them. Some of them, you know, are, there's an entry fee. Some of them are not, but I know a lot of times like entering those will really like one, get eyes on your script and two, you know, if best case scenario, you come out of it with some type of notoriety, then usually agents and managers start looking for you. Um, but I don't know if they're mandatory. I don't think so. I know plenty of people that don't have either. Uh, yeah, I wish I had better advice on that, but even that world is still kind of like new to me. <laughs> it's like five years into this. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. Um... So you both have different backgrounds, but we often get asked, do you need a degree to write for animation? Jeff is clearly proof that you don't. But do you guys have an input on like college or, you know, is there a degree that might be a good idea? Uh, nobody really cares about the degrees here <laughs> in animation. Yeah. Uh, they just care about if, if you can do the work. Um, and your portfolio. So no, you don't need to have a degree. Good to know. Um, how do you network as a writer, especially in this weird world where it's hard to go to networking events right now? I don't have any advice for networking right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I would say that um, I found networking, well, I wish somebody would have explained to me earlier that networking isn't like going out to every event to try to meet everybody or meet as many people as possible because all that ends up happening is like you just get a bunch of business cards and you eat yeah. sandwiches, which is <laughs> great. But uh, it's not like this one-time meeting isn't going to result 
in you being able to call on this person to like get an opportunity or anything. What really results in, you know, you getting another job or like, like meeting new collaborators is actual genuine connections with people. And that comes from making work, putting it out there and seeing like who's into it and seeing if you're into other people's stuff. And also it comes from like the people you've worked with before in any job, basically it's, um, and your classmates and your friends and their friends. So um, as somebody without um, a rep, that's sort of what I rely on to hear about opportunities is just friends and colleagues. Yeah, I think networking to me has always had this weird connotation of like, I have to like go to this party and meet this person and be like, hi, I love your work, please hire me. And it's not really <laughs> that. Um, for me, I mean, networking is just making friends, like truly friends, not like, oh, I wanna be friends with you because you can get me a thing, but like, oh, I like this person. We, we can hang out, we can talk, we can play board games or whatever. And <laughs> Um, because of that, I've been able to get work on other shows because people like me and they trust me and they know my work. And that's the important thing. It's like, not like, oh, I met this person at a cocktail party or whatever, but like, you know, me and this person get along and, you know, they hear, oh, they're looking for a freelancer and I'm going to mention my buddy. And that's usually what happens. And, you know, when that happens, you also have to be like, good enough to deliver on the job so you don't make your friend look like a jerk for recommending you. But usually it's just making friends and it doesn't even have to be like, oh, I made friends with this person who works on this show. It's, you know, like if you're trying to break into writing, get in a writing group, talk to other writers, have them read your work, read their work, give notes to each other. You can all grow and learn together. And then, you know, once those people start working, they might say, oh, I have this other friend I know from this writing group. Maybe I could recommend them. Like there's so many ways to network without it feeling like slimy and gross and just like, these are my friends, I support them. And in turn, they're gonna support me. And that's literally it, I think. Yeah, and um, it's, I think another mistake I made when I first started out networking, I was like, oh, I gotta like meet somebody who's like, really up at the top or something like those are the people who can give me the jobs but it's really the people at your level mm -hmm. um that's where you're gonna hear about the most opportunities that you're gonna be right for so cultivate your friendships yes and in terms or in regards of networking during this <laughs> i would say um a lot of people in animation are really nice. They will usually make time to talk to you. That said, this is a very stressful, tiring time. So please don't bother them. <laughs> if you reach out to them, please understand that they might not have the time to reach out to you. But a lot of people will because we all realize usually for the most part, how fortunate we are. And we are very happy to be doing the things that we are doing. And we all remember when we were trying to get to this point. Thus, we will usually take the time to give back something, whether that is, you know, I can hop on Zoom for 15 minutes for a coffee meeting, or, you know, I can exchange emails and answer a few questions. That doesn't mean send them your script and ask them to read it, <laughs> because as we mentioned, that can be time consuming, but it does, you know, if you can get some information from someone who's willing to help you, then, you know, worst case scenario, try. If you bother them, they hopefully won't remember it unless you are a very, very annoying person. But I'm sure none of you all are because you're here listening. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That's wonderful advice. Um, I got a question from Toon Boom as well. Uh, I thought, which was funny to get a question yeah. from uh, animation <laughs> program. <laughs> uh, but they asked, what should writers know about the craft of animation and the realities of a show's production pipeline? Uh, to be honest, <laughs> you know, to be a successful working writer, you don't have to know about like all the 
realities of the production pipeline. Um, but if you do want to become like a showrunner one day, you should get to know every single part of how a show is made. Um, getting to know how everyone does their jobs only makes you a better leader. Oh, I thought you were going to say something else. I didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I do think, though, that one important thing is, like I mentioned earlier, knowing how much work you're creating for the person after you. Um, storyboard artists, are they have a lot of work that they have to handle and not a lot of time to do it. So anything I can do as a writer to make their job a little easier is only going to be easier on the next person, which is probably revisions and the next person, which is, you know, as it trickles down. So because of that, um, just kind of be aware of that. If you really give someone a really action packed episode, maybe the next time if you can, you want to like try to give them a bit lighter so they can rest. But that's more of like a story editor thing, I would say, or a showrunner thing than necessarily a staff writer thing. But I don't think it hurts to know um, just what's coming up because it allows you to be a bit more uh, just aware of the work you're creating from everyone after you because writing literally is the start of the pipeline. Uh, I've got one more question before we jump into the Q&A. You guys have been so great. Uh, what sort of resources are there out there for aspiring TV animation writers? Um, there are so much. Um, I, in lieu of saying every single thing, I'll plug this. There's an incredible Google Doc created by Cassie Soliday. Um, it has a list of reading materials, um, sample scripts, um, actual scripts that have gone into production, um, links to writing software, and um, also writing fellowships, as um, Jeff has mentioned, um, that are so important to helping people get their foot in the door. Um, and it also has like all this advice from working writers as well. Um, but check it out. Um, her name is Cassie Soliday, S-O-L-I-D-A-Y. I can't add anything. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen that document. It's pretty great. So I definitely recommend that. So you guys ready to dive into the Q&A? We got time for a couple of them, I think. Um, first one I got, got here is, uh, if you've ever faced been faced with writer's block, what's something you can do to get past it? Easy one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Question my existence. Um, no, that's not helpful. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I suffer from writer's block um, when I'm writing alone a lot. Um, and the thing I try to do is just remove myself from the space of like where I can start spiraling and start doubting myself enough where it's like all the work is just going to, it's going to be impossible to finish. So I always take breaks. Like I do the system where I write for 25 minutes and then force myself to get up and like leave the room and go do something else for five minutes. And that way, at least I can like track, oh, I've done like two hours of writing today, at least like in those 25 increments or like I tried. Um, it's just little tiny steps to keep you motivated because you it will have bouts where you're like, what am I doing? I can't do this. But finding like little pockets to help you step away is helpful. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, usually I'll just try to like leave for a bit, go for a walk, go make some tea, go watch something I like. Because usually once I do that, my mind is distracted enough that when I come back to what I'm doing, I'm like, oh yeah, what was I working on? And then I just kind of am able to jump back in. But usually it's, I think trying to force it is where it just makes it worse. So usually just like a nice distraction, just to kind of take your mind off of it. Because I find that usually if you can't figure something out, the second you stop thinking about it, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's that's what I was looking for. That's why I came into this room. I was looking for my keys, you know? <laughs> like You just have to kind of distract yourself and your mind will allow you to kind of have that breakthrough you're looking for. Are there any common mistakes uh, or things to avoid for beginners when they're starting out becoming a writer? 
Spell check. <laughs> um, That's a life uh, advice there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, same. Use Google. Uh, you know, put all your docs in Google and let it check it. Um, but no, seriously, uh, some of the best advice I ever got was um, if you want to be a writer, don't just write or don't just watch or read good things. Watch and read bad things because your brain will fi figure out why they're bad and why they aren't working. And once you can pinpoint, oh, this story doesn't work because of this, then when you're writing your stories, you know what to avoid. So always, you know, you know, I watch a lot of bad movies. Uh, I have fun with it, but I'm also working. Um, and also, uh, I would say I had another thing and it completely jumped out of my head. So I'm going to stop thinking about it and it'll come back to me in a second. <laughs> See, already showing like, yeah. the advice. <laughs> um, I would say something that I... I've been told, but I didn't really know until it was like in person in the room is that writing your script is just one part of the job. Like a big part of getting into the room is also, are you a good team player? Can you work well with others mm -hmm. in close quarters for long periods of time? And are you supportive? Are you encouraging? Are you always pitching? solutions if there is a problem like don't only bring up problems but always have like some sort of answer to something that's bugging you in the script um, and that I think is probably one of the things I wish I had known earlier and don't be afraid to pitch things a lot of times I think <clears throat> especially when you're new to a room you might say oh, I don't, what if this is a bad idea or I don't want to pitch this, it's dumb. And then you don't pitch it and then someone pitches the exact thing you were thinking of and everyone's like, that's great. And you're like, I could have said it. Um, but also like, even if you pitch something and it doesn't work, so much of the room is, oh, well, now that you said that, it's made me think of this and I can pitch off of this. And it's like, so I think a lot of times there's that fear to kind of like speak up and say things for fear that you're going to be judged for them when in actuality, like if you don't say those things, you might not figure out like where you're trying to get. And the other thing that I remember because I stopped thinking about it <laughs> was uh, <laughs> try to pitch stories or try to come up with stories that aren't kind of like, uh, this is more, I guess, for spec scripts, but like, you know, for example, my spec script of The Office was of The Office, a show that was on a decade ago. It makes me feel very old. Um, but the episode was about like, oh, there's a paper selling contest, which is the most obvious story you can think of when you're doing The Office. So try to think of something that hasn't been done before. You know, think of five ideas and then throw those out and think of another one. Because the second that you think of something that may have already been done by someone else, then there's a good chance that someone's already done it. And you really want your samples or your specs or whatever to stand out, especially if you're going to like enter a fellowship or a program, you know, when they're going to get 80 scripts from Brooklyn Nine-Nine, you don't want to be like the 12th one about the one where Peralta gets himself locked in a cell with Holt. You want to have like, oh, this one's unique. You know, this is the one that stands out. Thank you guys. Um, I think we have time for like maybe one or two more. Uh, what do you do if you are the type of writer that has a million unfinished work in progresses and having a hard time finishing any of them? Um, Only easy questions for you guys. I would say <laughs> just try to pick one and really just finish it. It might be terrible in the end still, but the act of finishing something is important. And it shows that you can do it. it might give you the confidence to finish other things too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a, it's a tough position to be in. Yeah, I, I agree. I think just kind of plow through one, finish it, and usually that alleviates you so much that you're like, okay, I finished the thing. Now I can go to the next thing and you'll, ha you'll feel a bit freer. And then 
maybe you go back to the, you know, after you finish the next thing, you go back to the first one and kind of retool it or tweak it and kind of get it where you're happy with it. But just being able to close the book on one makes all the other books a bit more bearable. Yeah. And also um, I've found like having a couple of friends who I really trust, who know me well and like my work, like talking to them about some unfinished script, usually I can get ideas from them or like they get me excited again about, there's a reason why I started writing this in the first place. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you forget. And so you need to be reminded. Thank you guys. I think we can go into our final question, uh, which I have asked uh, of everyone for every single of these webinars we've done. Uh, what's the most important piece of advice you'd give an aspiring artist or writer in this case? It doesn't have to be art related. It can be life related. No pressure. Uh, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, uh. um, I would say keep going. Um, that's a bit of advice I got um, in film school, like you know, just making terrible movies. <laughs> um, but if you keep going, you'll get better and better. Um, keep making things. Um, it's a really long journey. And in the last two years, I, my career has taken off, but what you don't see is like the 10 years before that where I, nothing was happening for me, but I was like, I'm still going and making work myself so that when I finally did have the opportunity by luck, like I had a bunch of stuff that I had made that I was ready to show. So just keep going and don't give up. Wow, that's great advice. I'm going to take that. That's my advice, too. No. Um, <laughs> have fun with it. Writing is, writing is hard. Writing is so hard. And it's, it's hard to put yourself out there. It's hard to put all your work on the page and put it in front of somebody and have them judge it. It's hard to tell jokes and not get laughs. It's hard. But... You, there, there's something about it that you have to love, whether it's telling stories, whether it's telling jokes, whether it's like just having that opportunity to have somebody get lost in your work, whether it's inspiring other people. There's something in it to find and love and enjoy because you're putting yourself out there for anyone to see your work or read your work or hopefully enjoy your work. So at the very least, have fun doing it and feel, you know, try to walk away with it as, even if no one likes this, I had fun writing it. I got to tell the story that I wanted to tell and that is the important thing. Well, oh, did you wanna add oh, something no, else, Kate? Complimenting. <laughs> 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 Well, thank you both so much for uh, taking time from your super busy schedules of walking in circles, trying to figure out what to write. Um, really appreciate you both being here today. Uh, I want to thank, take a moment to thank uh, Jackie and Sally for helping me field questions and you know run this webinar. And thank you, audience, for watching. Um, for future panels and more information about Cartoon Network Studios recruiting, please check out our website, cartoonnetworkstudios.com, and check out our Twitter and Instagrams, CNS underscore recruiting, like Cartoon Network Studios recruiting. Uh, thank you all again, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Get filthy rich on your trick. I'm going to get filthy rich on your trick. I'm going to get filthy rich on your trick. I'm going to get filthy rich on your trick. I'm going to get filthy rich on your trick. I'm going to